What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and welcome back to a slightly belated edition of the Best Armies in 40k. I was away this weekend streaming the DreamHack Invitational, which was quite a trip away from my normal studio. Unfortunately, it was out of network on my way back, so I wasn't able to put this video together over the weekend on my trip like I normally do, so we're doing it now instead. This is for the weekend of June 1st and 2nd, 2024, and we had an interesting weekend of Warhammer events. Not too many large events, not too many major or super major level events. However, we did have quite a volume of smaller events, GTs and GT plus level events between 20 and 60 players. So we're gonna have a lot of lists to talk about, as you can see, as we move to the metagame breakdown. Now, orcs were absolutely killing it this weekend. They went undefeated at the War Games for Warriors, Battle for Vanheim, where they had an XO and one record with a very interesting list that we're gonna be talking about later on in the video, as well as the Thalassine Cup. They also took down the Bedburger Scheunenkloppen event with two undefeated orc players going first and second with a 5-0 record at that event. Moving on, Eldari returns to the top of the game with two 5-0 records, both at the Bug Eater GT and the 2D6 Dawn of War, alongside Necrons, who also went undefeated not only at the 2D6 Dawn of War, like Eldari did, but also at the Wild Hunt Summer. Chaos Space Marines, with their new army rules, taking down both the Broadside Bash and PNW Warlords Clash, both of those with two separate detachments out of that new codex. We saw both Renegade Raiders and Pact Bound Zealots going undefeated this weekend. And given that it is a new codex, it probably makes sense to talk about both of them, so I'll be covering both varieties of Chaos Space Marines this time around. Now, one thing we did not see is quite the same representation of classic Space Marines as we have. I I know that a lot of Space Marine players, especially in team formats, which are limited in the number of factions that can be represented, tend to have an, a lot of overlap with Chaos Space Marines, and a lot of them have moved to Chaos Space Marines. We still saw three undefeated results using Space Marines, one with Ultramarines at War Games for Warriors, one with Black Templars at the Bug Eater GT, and one with Space Wolves at the PNW Warlords Clash. Thousand Suns also saw some success at the Epic GT, and coming out of the woodwork, we also have an undefeated result from the new Adeptus Custodes. While their codex is not that great, they were able to go X0 and 1 at the battle for Vanheim, tying with Orcs. Moving on, Grey Knights also went undefeated at the Hydra GT. Tyranids and Adeptus Rorotas went 5-0 at the Spring Assault at Ironweld. Drukari took down the Ontario League Invitational. Tau Empire with their new 10th edition codex, taking down the Dice Hammer Open 7. And last but certainly not least, one final result from the Bug Eater GT. Gene Stealer Cults with an X-0 and one record, one draw on their record at that event. So jumping in with Orcs. Now, one interesting part about recording this later than I normally do is that I actually went through a lot of lists on this list back in my Tuesday live stream. And that is the case for some of the more standard orc varieties that went undefeated this weekend. We saw some bully boys, some green tide do well, but what I want to talk about today is Martin Holtgren's dread mob from the battle for Vanheim. Martin was running a big mech with smoky gubbins to give his unit stealth plus three shock attack gun big mechs. Those were backed up by a war boss as well as Zodgrod Wartsnaga. The war boss had a unit of 20 boys to jump into to act as a little bit of backline support, and Zodgrod was jumping into a unit of 20 Gretchen to provide all of his bonuses to them. The Gretchen have good synergy within Dreadmob because they're able to use their reactive move stratagem that the detachment gives them access to, giving you an incredibly strong high OC, relatively resilient brick to put it in the center of the table, thanks to Zodgrod's leadership ability, and then make it hard to engage with thanks to that reactive move. We then had a battle wagon and Gorkonaut plus two trucks to carry around the three units of 10 Ludas that the shock attack on big mechs were jumping into. The attached mech gives the Ludas access to the press the red button ability from the detachment roll. Plus the unit is also granting hit rerolls when targeting enemies on objectives to the big mech shock attack gun as well. We had a unit of three smash a gun mech guns, probably for the remaining mech to jump into, plus two units of storm boys 
to act as utility. Moving on to Eldari. We saw two wildly different varieties of Eldari go undefeated this weekend, both at the Bug Eater GT and at Dawn of Flar. I did talk about the Bug Eater GT list on my Tuesday live stream, but today we're going to talk about Colin Power's battle host from that Dawn of Flar event. Colin Power was running a Yanari list, taking only Yvrain as the single character in the list. So we have left our Farseers and Autarks at home. Yvrain being the Warlord gives you access to Drukari units that can join into the battle host. And since they are Eldari keyworded models, gain access to basically all of the battle host attachment abilities and stratagems. We had one unit of Storm Guardians, three units of Dark Reapers to add some indirect fire, three units of five Warp Spiders, one unit of five Swooping Hawks to act as utility, plus three D cannon support weapon platforms as some indirect fire anti-tank. Following that up, we also had three units of five Scourges. These guys running Drukari Haywire Blasters for their devastating wound anti-vehicle shooting. We then had two units of Reavers and a unit of Mandrake, giving this list some of the most insane level of utility I've ever seen. Between the Shadow Spectres and Scourges, we had five units with a Shoot and Scoot ability, plus the Warp Spiders and Swooping Hawks could be used to jump up the table in order to score the objectives that we want. With the massive number of individual shooting activations all backed up by that battle host reroll, this army had the ability to combine its firepower targeting basically anything and take it down, especially with Yvrain and the Storm Guardians acting as a little bit of a melee counterpunch. That was backed up by indirect fire shooting from the Dark Weepers and support weapon platforms that could take out heavier targets that moved up to the center of the table and made for one of the most unique Eldar lists that we've seen in a really long time. Now moving on to Necrons, today we're going to be talking about Eric Gibbs list from the Wild Hunt Summer. Eric was running a Canoptech court, but a little bit of an interesting variety. This list was running a single Catan Shard, even after the Catan Shard's cost increase, we make an appearance in this list. We then had three Technomancers, one with a Dimensional Sanctum and one with an Auto Divinator. Those guys were jumping into three units of six Canoptech Wraiths. I have an entire video about Canoptech Wraiths and why they're good, and also how to beat them that I posted a couple of weeks ago, you can go check out. But these guys were also buffing two units of Scarab Swarms. While the Scarab Swarms are nearby the Technomancers, they do gain an objective control value, so they are able to move out, grab objectives, and complete a wider variety of secondaries more easily. Speaking of secondaries, we also had two units of Tomb Blades and two units of Death Marks. The Tomb Blades adding a fast scouting option that can both act as a screen or a body block, but also can be used to push aggressively forward and score early game secondaries before the Canoptic Wraiths or the Scarabs are on the objectives that you might need them to be. In addition, we also had two units of Death Marks that can act as Deep Strikers for exactly the same reason. That is all in support of what boils down to a relatively normal Canoptic Court build, taking those three units of Wraiths I mentioned earlier, plus three Canoptic Doomstalkers as its actual damage output. The interesting part about this list is the inclusion of all that additional utility. A lot of times these lists will focus on Scarab Swarms or will simply rely on the Canoptic Wraiths to do their actions for them. But this variety is putting a little bit more emphasis on that Catan Shard of the Nightbringer and shoring up the big point investment that that guy has by taking all of these smaller little units in order to remain relevant on secondary objectives. Now let's move on to Chaos Space Marines. We're gonna talk about two distinct varieties of Chaos Space Marines today, and the first one's gonna be Steve Trimbles from the PNW Warlords Clash. This is a Renegade Raiders list, two Master of Executions, one with Mark of the Hound to give his unit scout, alongside a Chaos Lord. These guys would join into some combination of the three units of Legionaries in the list, two units of five and one unit of 10, alongside Abaddon the Despoiler. We had two Rhinos to carry the Legionaries around or potentially the Chosen if they did not have Abaddon attached. Two units of five Legionaries and one unit of ten Legionaries could split up between the two Rhinos and even act as a little bit of a firing platform for the two units of five, which both were equipped with three per chain cannons that could fire out of the Rhinos firing decks. We then had a single Cultist Mob as well as two Venom Crawlers and two units of Warp Talons. Now the Venom Crawlers are an interesting inclusion in this detachment, plus one AP when targeting enemies on objectives from the detachment ability definitely shores up one of the main weaknesses of the Venom Crawler, which is it's relatively low AP, even though it has a high attack volume. So these guys being a little bit of a cheap trading unit definitely makes sense. I have an entire video talking about exactly how strong the Warp Talons are in this detachment that you can go check out. I'll drop a link on the card here. So I don't think it's too surprising to see two units of 10 in the list. 
Abaddon is an interesting inclusion. He has a huge brick of points, but he does give you some CP regen as well as hit rerolls, which is the one thing that the detachment doesn't really give you that much access to. Questionable part is going to be delivering him alongside the much faster infantry in the list. You can get advance and charge from either the chosen or the stratagems available in the detachment to get him up the table. And if he can be in a position to benefit units like the warp talents that won't normally be able to be affected by the transport disembarkation buffs that the detachment normally has, he's going to send those guys damage outputs through the absolute roof. That gives them more opportunities to clear out whatever they're engaging or put themselves in positions where they can warp strike later on in that phase and makes those units absolutely unstoppable. Moving on, we'll move over to the broadside bash where James Carmona went undefeated with a packed bound zealot list. Now, if you are familiar with the index variety of Chaos Space Marines, you should be relatively familiar with packed bound zealots because it is a mostly unchanged version of Slaves to Darkness from that index. James was running two Chaos Lords, both with Mark of Slanesh, and this is a very Slanesh-focused list. While it wasn't 100% Slanesh, there was a lot of it in there. Those Chaos Lords were jumping into two units of Legionaries. We had two units of five Slanesh Legionaries who could jump into two of the Slanesh Chaos Rhinos in the list. Gaining advanced charge from the Slanesh Stratagem in the detachments. These guys have pretty reasonable threat range, and they're a good delivery system for the Chaos Lords, since they are granting wound rerolls against enemies on a objectives, which the Chaos Lords absolutely love. Combining wound rerolls with the Devastating Wound Demon Hammer, these guys do an absolutely insane amount of damage. We then saw three units of Accursed Cultist, two with Mark of Slanesh, one with Mark of Nurgle, plus two Nurgle Predator Destructors, two Nurgle Forge Fiends, and those all backed up by a Nurgle Hellbrute to give them access to both lethal and sustain when they use their Dark Pacts. Following the Nurgle theme, we had one unit of Nurglings to act as utility, and again, two units of Warp Talons. Interestingly, one of them was bringing Mark of Nurgle, which, while it doesn't really improve their combat effectiveness very much, it does give them access to Dark Obscuration. The other unit being Mark of Slanesh, which gives them an improved critical when Dark Pacting for sustained hits, which they definitely want to do in many situations situations, given that their weapons are twin linked, so each of those sustained hits is fairly effective, and again gives them access to the advanced and charge stratagem, which allows them to achieve their extreme threat range. Those guys could go out and clear enemy utility units fairly easily before warp striking away, which then forces your opponent to bring in the heavier hitters, which you can counter attack with either the powerful shooting in the list or the chaos lords disembarking with their legionnaire cohorts. And then moves us on to loyalist space marines. We'll start with Colin K's Black Templars from the Bug Eater GT. We've talked about Colin K's variety of Black Templars Ironstorm Spearhead in the past, mostly using the fact that Black Templars gain access to multiple varieties of Primaris transports, including a Black Templars Repulsor Executioner, which pays a slight increased points value for a multi-melta, but it, because it is a separate data sheet from the standard Repulsor Executioner, allows you to break the rule of three. You can take both Black Templars Repulsor Executioners and Standard Repulsor Executioners in a list, taking up to three of each. That allows Colin to take a total of four Repulsor Executioners in the list, three Standard ones, and one Black Templars one, plus two Black Templars Gladiator Lancers and a Land Raider Redeemer to round out the armored contingent. Those are backed up by a ton of characters, all of which have access to lone operative besides a single Emperor's Champion to be a little bit of a melee counterpunch. That includes three Combi Weapon Lieutenants, one with Master of Machine War to give advance and shoot to the vehicles, plus two Tech Marines, one with Adept of the Omnissiah to blank incoming damage, and one with target augury web to give all these guys lethal hits, which especially buffs the defensive arrays and small arms on those four repulsor executioners. Moving on to ultramarines, we continue to see Ironstorm spearheads doing well for the Space Marine Codex. Evan Stump went undefeated with an ultramarines Ironstorm spearhead build, taking a combi weapon lieutenant with Master of Machine War, like we just talked about, and a single tech marine with target augury web. Last but certainly not least, we are getting some ultramarine spice in there, taking Marnius Calgar in a unit of Company heroes. He gives you CP regen, which is incredibly strong for a list like this that tends to be pretty CP intensive using stratagems to buff up the many vehicles in the list. And it gives you a relatively fast melee counterpunch. Unlike the vehicles, Marnius Calgar can advance and charge when attached to those company heroes. So while the vehicles can only advance and shoot, Calgar can act relatively quickly to respond to enemy threats moving into the armored front line. That armored front line was composed of two Redemptor Dreadnoughts plus a Gladiator Reaper and was followed up by three Repulsor Executioners. For all of the synergies that they have with the detachment, getting both lethal hits from the target augury web on their billion trillion tiny guns, 
but also floating rerolls from the detachment ability on their laser destroyers. We then had three scout squads and a Calidus assassin to act as utility. Now last, but certainly not least, we also saw some success from Space Wolves this weekend at the PNW Warlords Clash. This one was a Stormlands task force run by Nicholas from. Nicholas was taking a relatively standard variety of the maximum Thunderwolf, maximum Wolfen Stormlands build that Space Wolves have popularized. That included a combi weapon lieutenant as well as a Phobos Librarian, Lorgan Grimnar on his Storm Rider, plus three Wolfguard Battle Leaders on Thunderwolves, and a single Thunderwolf Lord. We then had Hounds of Morkai, which is an interesting inclusion to give you a little bit of anti-psyker forward operators. Those guys could attach into the Phobos Librarian to gain their lone operative effect. We also saw two scout squads, plus three units of Thunderwolf Cavalry and three units of 10 Wolfen, a Calidus Assassin to bring in the rear Moving on from there, we have the natural predator of the Space Marines, and probably the reason that we are taking Hounds of Morkai in that specific variety of list, the Thousand Sons. Francisco Queiroz went undefeated with a Cult of Magic, taking Aramon on a disc, plus two Exalted Disc Sorcerers to slow down enemy units, two Infernal Masters, one of them with the Arcane Vortex, Magnus the Red, alongside an Umbralific Crystal Thousand Sun Sorcerer. The Umbralific Crystal, pretty good on that specific guy, because all of his ranged weapons are in fact only range 12, so he's typically teleporting up close to enemies where he can use his short-ranged weapons. Last, but certainly not least, Lord of Forbidden Lore attached to a winged demon prince. These guys are pretty interesting in that they can use the Lord of Forbidden Lore to be double moved multiple times and potentially do their bombing run effect each time, giving you access to a reasonable number of mortal wounds from these guys. That was backed up by four units of five Rubric Marines to attach in with the Infernal Masters, Sorcerer, and Aramon on disc, plus a ton of UT Utility. One unit of Zangors for OC2 Light Infantry, plus three units of Chaos Cultists. The Triple Chaos Cultists is absolutely incredible. In uh, the Triple Chaos Cultists is absolutely incredible with their updated points value from the last Munitorum Field Manual. They give Thousand Suns access to a lot of CP regen, because if you're able to commit them one per round, you can actually be gaining quite a bit of CP from your opponent killing the Chaos Cultists. They also are incredible against melee armies, especially armies like Orcs that are trying to ground pound a bunch of guys out of transports at you, since you can double move the Thousand Suns Cultists right up in front of their transports and prevent them from disembarking or moving through the Cultists' coherency in order to prevent them from getting to your squishy Rubric Marines. Definitely one of the reasons that Thousand Suns are so strong against against those varieties of aggressive melee armies. Now, speaking of aggressive melee armies, let's move over to Adeptus Custodes. David Klang took a Talons of the Emperor list to an undefeated record at the Battle for Vanheim. Now, this was an X0 and 1 record. These Adeptus Custodes ended up uh, basically tying for second place with Orcs, the Orc Dread Mob that we talked about at the top of this video. But Adeptus Custodes going undefeated is, first of all, very impressive, but also we were rocking Talons of the Emperor, a detachment that we really haven't seen people try out since the new Codex came out. Although, it does give access to a ton of strong effects. The list was led by two Blade Champions alongside Valyrian. Valyrian in there to increase the survivability of a Custodian Warden squad. He can reduce incoming AP targeting his unit. We also saw two units of Custodian Guard, one of four and one of five. That five was joined in with Lord Inquisitor Kyria Draxis, who can not only buff their offensive power by adding her own incredible volume of ranged attacks to the unit, but you can also stack that with Talons Interlocked to gain plus one strength and AP on all of those attacks, giving you lots of strength five wound rerolling guardian spear shots with the ability to double tap, plus Kyria Draxis's absolute bevy of two damage attacks from both her gun and her psychic power. We then had two Caladius Grav Tanks and two units of Custodian Wardens to jump those characters into. Plus, we were unlocking a bunch of the Talons of the Emperor synergies with three units of Prosecutors and a unit of Witch Seekers. Some of those units could jump into a Psychana Rhino, which could potentially be gaining Scout if the only unit that you embark into it are the Witch Seekers. That gives you lots of access to the Detachment Aura that Sisters of Silence will get to grant Adeptus Custodes units a 5 plus Feel No Pain against Psychic Attacks and Mortal wounds, which can certainly help in matchups like the Thousand Suns that we just discussed previously. Now, moving on from there, we have a similarly elite army in Grey Knights. Martin Nielsen took a Grey Knight Teleport Strike Force to an undefeated record at the Hydra GT. Martin was running a 
Foot Grand Master with the Sigil of Exigence to give him that reactive redeployment in response to enemy ranged attacks. A Nemesis Dread Knight Grand Master with Inescapable Wrath to him a charge bonus, plus Kaldor Drago. We had a big unit of 10 Brotherhood Terminators, plus a big 10 model Paladin squad as well. Typically, Kaldor Drago jumps into the Brotherhood Terminators to grant them his once per game charge buff, and the Brotherhood Terminators getting lethal hits on the charge makes that whole combination actually do some pretty reasonable damage once it gets to melee. The Paladin squads, however, with five side cannons in the squad, thanks to their Ancient also getting access to a side cannon for whatever reason, can join the Grand Master to give them a total of six side cannons and the ability to skirmish with enemy ranged attackers thanks to that Sigil of Exigence. They can jump in very aggressively, Mists of Deimos in response to melee attacks, and Sigil of Exigence in response to ranged attacks, giving them the ability to alpha strike their opponent basically with impunity. We then had that followed up by three Nemesis Dread Knights and an Eversore Assassin. Bit of a departure from the standard Nemesis Dread Knight spam lists, but we have been seeing Brotherhood Terminators and Paladins get more play over the last couple of weeks, which is interesting. Now moving on to the Spring Assault at Iron Weld, we saw Samuel Pope go undefeated with a Tyranid Invasion Fleet. Samuel is recently coming off a US Open win with Tyranid Unending Swarm and kind of retains that energy with this version of Invasion Fleet. It does include a Turvagon with Adaptive Biology to give it a powerful Feel No Pain, plus a Winged Hive Tyrant to give access to free uses of rapid regeneration. That can be used on the three units of 20 termagants in the list, which gives it an immense amount of board presence with tons of high OC units with reactive moves and the ability to regenerate themselves thanks to both the stratagem in Invasion Fleet and the Turvagon respawning them as well. Those are protected by a unit of Venomthropes to give all those little guys stealth, plus a Biovore for scoring, three Exocrines to act as backline shooting, two Maliceptors to be mid-board tanks alongside that Turvagon, plus a single Pyrovore, a Tyranofex, interestingly, with an acid spray to be a little bit of a Overwatch bot, and a unit of Zoanthropes to add some anti-tank as well. Also undefeated at that event was Adeptus Sororitas. Tony Phillips went undefeated with a Hallowed Martyrs list. This one was running a Palatine, the Blade of St. Eleanor, St. Celestine, and Morvin Vol. We had one Battle Sisters squad equipped with Meltaguns and Multimeltas. That could be combat squatted into the one Immolator in the list. It was running twin Multimeltas. We also had a Sororitas Rhino know that could deliver Arcoflagellants to the fight, of which there were 30. We then had two Battle Cannon Castigators, a unit of Death Cult Assassins, and one single Mortifier to act as utility, Paragon Warsuits for Morvan Vault to join into, a single Penitent Engine, and a ton of Jump Pack Infantry, one unit of Zephyrum and three units of Seraphim to both act as utility and potentially be a Bodyguard unit for St. Stelestine, although she doesn't necessarily need to have that Bodyguard unit. It does give you some interesting ability to take saves on the Gemini Superior and keep her Bodyguards alive for longer than is normal, although oftentimes only at T3 the bodyguards will get killed relatively trivially. Now that moves us on to Drew Kari, which went undefeated at the Ontario League Invitational. This was by Skari from Scardcast, Ridvan Martinez, who characteristically is running an absolutely wild list. This is a Sky Splinter Assault, but only brought three transports, two Venoms and a single Raider to benefit from the Sky Splinter Assault detachment ability. Embarking into those were some combination of two Archons and Lilith Hesperax. We did have 10 Witches for Lilith Hesperax to join into and give her leadership buff too, but we also had a Cabalite Warrior Squad and a Court of the Archon plus a unit of five Incubi that could all be benefited from the Archons attaching. We then had a single Kronos to regenerate pain tokens, three units of Hellions, two units of five and one unit of 10, plus two units of Mandrakes, two units of Scourges to add some long range shooting, and speaking of long range shooting, two Razorwing Jet Fighters. It's been a little while since we've seen aircraft taken in large numbers, especially in 10th edition. They've been a kind of underplayed unit archetype, so I think a lot of people are unprepared for the level of flexibility that aircraft can give a list. While they can't start on the table, since they must start in reserve, once it comes down to turn two, if the terrain doesn't have a lot of true line of sight blocking elements, since they ignore the ruin characteristic of automatically blocking line of sight that is traced over the area of ruined terrain, they actually give you a lot of pretty hefty anti-tank that can attack units that would normally be entirely hidden. Each of these Razor Wing Jet Fighters is rocking two Dark Lances. They also have a pretty wide variety of options that they can fire out of their Razor Wing missiles. Either D6, one or two damage, Shatterfield or Monoscythe missiles, 
or two plus anti-infantry neurotoxin missiles that give them a lot of additional options. They also get plus one to hit against enemies that cannot fly, making them good at hunting enemy tanks and other heavier vehicles that are ground-based. While they won't work against things like Tau gunships, they will work against heavier tanks like Space Marine Repulsors and Land Raiders, making them very efficient and not necessarily requiring the pain tokens that tend to be kind of hard to come by in a Sky Splinter Assault list. Now, speaking of Tau gunships, Ships, we can move on to Tau because we do have an undefeated Tau list using the 10th edition codex this week. Jason McKenzie going undefeated with a Retaliation Cadre. This is the Battlesuit Focus Detachment from the Codex, and the list was running a Cold Star Commander with a prototype weapon system, a Cold Star Commander with internal grenade racks, and an Enforcer Battlesuit with the Star Flare Ignition. We also had a single Ethereal who I think was just in there to act as a little bit of backline utility, plus he can also generate you command points for only 50 points, which is pretty nice. And each of those commanders was jumping into one of the many Crisis Battlesuit teams in the army. We had one Fire Knife unit equipped with Missile Pods, a Star Scythe unit equipped with Flamers, a Sunforge unit equipped with Fusion Blasters, alongside two Ghost Keels, and a lot of Forward Operators, a Crew Carnivore unit, plus a Pathfinder unit, and two Piranhas. Backing that up, we then had three units of Stealth Battlesuit, to spot enemies and give you reroll ones to hit and wound, plus two Riptide Battlesuits with Ion Accelerators to act as backline shooting. And that moves us on last, but certainly not least, back to the Bug Eater GT, where we had an undefeated result from Gene Steeler Cults. Nicholas Bialik went undefeated with GSC, who are looking down the barrel of a new codex. We're currently in sort of a spoiler season for that new codex, and we're getting preview articles from Warhammer Community right now, but we are, are still on the classic Index Ascension Day so far. Nicholas was running a bio fake with Inscrutable Cunning to give him Infiltrators, which he was adding on to a big unit of 10 Aberrants. We then had a Clamavus with Meticulous Planar, a single Kelomorph for utility and to jump in with enemy units, alongside a Nexos for some CP economy, two Primuses to give rerolls, one of them with Prowling Adjutant to give a reactive move, plus two Reductus Saboteurs. We then had two units of 10 Acolyte Hybrids, those guys equipped with Demolition Charges, plus a unit of 10 Neophyte Hybrids to be a little bit of a utility unit, and two units of 20 20 Neophyte Hybrids with Seismic Cannons and Grenade Launchers to be the Army's Hammer. Alongside the 10 Aberrants, we also saw a Achilles Ridge Runner, and interestingly, two units of Pure Strain Gene Stealer. Pure Strains with Infiltrate and the ability to advance and charge are excellent at clearing out enemy screening units. With a high volume of reasonably effective melee attacks, they are good at clearing out enemy utility units. Things like Space Marine Infiltrators can get knocked out fairly easily by these guys, especially once a couple buffs or indirect fire is applied. And that gives the Army a lot more ability to operate around the table. They can also be used to open up space for the aberrants to deploy, infiltrating up alongside the reductive saboteurs aggressively in order to block enemy infiltration deployment, which then gives you better spots to place those aberrants later on in the deployment step. Inclusions like this give Gene Stealer Cults a lot more early game board presence that they aren't normally used to having, which can definitely circumvent a normal weakness of the faction, which is getting heavily screened on battle round two or three. And with that, those are all the best armies in Warhammer 40k for this week. Let me know down in the comment section which one is your favorite and what you thought about the massive volume of lists that we had to talk about this week. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members, and Twitch subscribers. All you people are amazing and I love you. Remember to be classy folks and have a happy wargaming.